All right, today we're going to take a look at a concept in rotational mechanics that's called moment of inertia. Um, the most concise way to say what a moment of inertia actually is, is it's a measure of an object's resistance to angular acceleration. So another way to say that is it, it, it lets you know how resistant an object is to having its rotational speed changed, okay? So um, for example, an object like this, it's pretty easy to change the rotational speed of this object if I rotate it this way, okay? That thing may be rotating 10 times per second or something like that, where if I want the thing to rotate like this 10 times per second, that, uh, that's much more difficult to do. So what we'll see is this object has a greater moment of inertia around this axis than it does around this axis. And so we're just going to play with this idea a little bit. So to really build up a sense of what moment of inertia is, it helps to go back to, instead of talking about rotation, to go back to things that are moving straight lines or translating. Okay, so let's, let's look at uh, how we handle the translation of an object through space. When you want to learn how an object's going to translate, you generally talk about the forces that act on it. So we say the sum of the forces is ma. We can think of the forces as a cause of acceleration, right? But then you have this thing in the front of the acceleration that, of course, we know as the mass. But really what this thing is, is it's a resistance to linear acceleration. The larger the mass, the more difficult it is to get something to accelerate all right, uh, to, in a, a, along a line, right? So there's, um, that's for translation. Well, then if we want to talk about things that rotate, so rotation, we can kind of do the analogous thing and say, well, the thing that causes linear acceleration is forces. The thing that causes angular acceleration is actually torques, or the rotational version of force. So we say the rotational version of force is equal to the rotational version of mass, which is actually the thing we're going to talk about today. I'm going to call it I for now. That's the notation that's traditionally used for it, um, times angular acceleration, right? So forces cause linear accelerations, torques cause angular accelerations, and then this thing is going to be the sort of the rotational analog of mass. Um, so like in quotes, maybe I'll put it, it's kind of like a rotational, it's kind of like a rotational mass, okay? Um, it's more accurately is it's again it's resistance to angular acceleration. Okay. To get an even better handle on this thing, what we can do is say, well, if we look at the kinetic energy of a translating object, that's one half m v squared, right? That's for translation. For rotation, what we want to do is find kind of the analog of this, where what we want to do is, in, put, instead of putting it in terms of the linear velocity, we want to put the kinetic energy of something that's rotating in terms of its angular velocity, and then try to get a handle on what this thing is. Okay, so that's going to be our approach to, to try to get a better sense of what this thing actually is, what it actually means. Well, so the easiest system to look at is just what's called a point mass, just an, just an object like a marble um, orbiting or going in a circle. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll just have a little point mass m that's orbiting in a circle of, of radius r. So let's give this thing a, a radius. And then we're just going to say that it's, it's moving along with a, with a speed v. So it's just going around in a circle like this, OK? Well, what we can do is, of course, the kinetic energy of that object is 1 half mv squared, right? But what we want to do is get it in terms of angular speed, okay? In terms of the angular, angular speed. Well, if you remember, oh, say your algebra 2, if you want to know the, the distance that something has traveled, right, what you would do is you would look at the, the distance it's traveled, say, along an arc, you look at the angle that it cranked through, 
and then this arc length or this distance that it's traveled would be r theta. So you'd say, okay, the distance it travels is r theta. If you find the rate of change of this distance, of this position, that's going to be its speed, which is called v, okay? And then the rate of change of this side, well, r does not change. Theta does change with time, and we call the rate at which theta changes with time omega, or the angular velocity, right? So what we're going to do is substitute for v, we're going to put in um, r omega. And so what you get then is ke uh, rotational version then. Just substitute r omega for v. So you get 1 half m, and then you get... Um, r omega, but then the entire thing squared, or in other words, one half m r squared omega squared. The reason I did that, what that means is this quantity right here, this m r squared, that must be this thing we were looking for that's kind of like the rotational version of mass. So what this is saying is to make something more difficult to angularly accelerate, there's two ways to go about it. You can either increase the object's mass, right? I mean, that, that would make it more difficult to make this thing spin around this point um, or to change the speed at which this thing spins around that, that point. Or you could make the thing farther away from the center, okay? So with, with an object, the key in making it more difficult to angularly accelerate, more difficult to, to sort of twist back and forth, is you want it to A, be heavy, and B, have some mass that's very, very far away. Well, so now if we go back to the case of this uh, meter stick, it's very easy to change the angular speed of the thing this way. That's because there's very little mass, well, the mass is not very far from the axis, okay? Well, if you then want to try to spin it like this, now you've got mass that's farther and farther from the axis. That's more difficult to give this thing an angular acceleration um, in this sense or uh, around this axis. Um, so what we just figured out is what's called the moment of inertia for a point mass then. It's just mass times distance from the axis squared. distance from axis, All right? Final point, you want something with a large moment of inertia, have it be massive, and have that mass distributed very far away from the uh, axis, right? Now you've probably got this innate sense of moment of inertia from thinking about a thing like, uh, oh, if somebody were gonna come up to me and try to spin me as fast as possible, and I didn't want them to, of course, I would splay out like this to be difficult to rotate, right? Um, if I did want them to rotate me, to spin me up to high speed, I would tuck in. So you've seen that kind of figure skate effect before where they start spinning like this, and then when they pull in tight, they'll rotate really fast. Now, why is that? I know we've just met this idea of moment of inertia, but Right? If you think about something moving in a straight line, its momentum, its linear momentum is mass times velocity. Right? Now, if the, imagine a railroad car rolling with a certain speed. Well, if suddenly you dump water in it from above, in order for it to keep its horizontal momentum, if you add mass, the, the velocity will drop. Right? Well, think about something that's spinning, but then suddenly its moment of inertia increases. If the moment of inertia I goes up, then the rotation rate omega will go down. Well, so that's basically what you see when you have something that's starting with, say, a high speed and low moment of inertia, and then if you spread out, you know, say, slow down, speed back up, slow down. If the moment of inertia increases for a rotating object suddenly, then that uh, angular speed is going to have to drop in order to compensate.